we're going to be looking at a work of art by Peter Paul Rubens and Anthony Van Dyke called The Feast of Simon the Pharisee. The painting was completed in Flanders between 1618 and 1620, and it is an oil on canvas. It is a fine example of a Baroque painting, Baroque being a period of art, an era of art that started after 1600 and followed the High Renaissance and Mannerism. And the Baroque artist broke with the traditional Renaissance artists in that they used light very intentionally, dark areas, light areas. They used color very boldly. They tried to create tension and movement within their works. And they've certainly done this in this painting. We have all of the um, servants behind the figures, bringing in the food and carrying things. We have what appears to be a lively conversation going on. And then, oddly, we have this woman kneeling at Christ's feet in the very center of the painting, but kind of below our sight line. The top of the table, most of the action is occurring above the table, but the woman who is the catalyst for the discussion above the table is kneeling at Christ's feet. Now, when we read the biblical account of this story, a little part of it can be confusing because they say that she stood behind Christ and was crying and wiping his feet with her hair. And you're like, but how could she do that if she was behind him? Well, back in biblical times, they didn't sit in chairs at the table. The tables were quite low and they reclined on cushions and they would rec recline on one elbow and eat with the other hand. And so his feet would have actually been behind him because he'd have been laying down in a reclined position. That was how they sat at the table. So that makes sense. Now, as you've noticed, there are two painters for this work, and that's because painters in this period worked within workshops, and Rubens was the master painter, and he had a workshop, and Van Dyck was his assistant. And we know that both of them worked on this painting. We can't tell who exactly painted what because Van Dyck was so skilled at mimicking Rubens' work. And so, um, but we have the whole painting done by the two of them. Now, Rubens was influenced by time that he spent in Italy. He went to Italy to learn more and to gain knowledge and to see the masterpieces of the high Renaissance artists. He didn't want to be them. He wanted to be a Baroque painter, but there was much to be learned in Rome, and so he traveled there. And he was exposed to Michelangelo and Titian. Those were the two that he really resonated with. And so in this painting, we see that influence. We see Titian's use of color in this painting, the deep, beautiful colors. And we see the sculptural integrity of the figures and their kind of massive size and muscular frames that are reflective of Michelangelo's influence. And again, we have this Baroque tool of moving all the action into the front of the frame that everything is in the foreground and it creates more of a sense of immediacy. The lighting is stark. We have a lot of darkness on the right side of the painting where the black just kind of frames Christ and the disciples. So they just stand against it. And on the left-hand side, we have far more color and movement and light. The woman in the painting is kind of below the action. And yet she is the catalyst. The white tablecloth draws a line through the painting and sort of frames her and sets her apart between the two men, Simon and Jesus, and the table, kind of frame her in. We're not told her name, just that she was a sinful woman, uh, which I find really harsh. In the New Testament, we frequently didn't learn women's names. There's the woman caught in the act of adultery, the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well, whatever. They're just given in terms of their story and are not named. And that was true of this woman. Now, Rubens has conceived of the painting as a conflict between the Pharisees and Jesus, and he has actually set the entire work up, framed the painting to highlight the conflict. And he wants us to see the world of the Pharisees being dominated by wealth and material goods. We see the way they're dressed. There's fur on some of their cloaks. Um, 
they're very well off. And in terms of their religious dogmatism. And then on the right hand side, we have Christ and his disciples, kind of a scruffier looking band over there. And their values of love, charity, mercy, grace, those kind of attributes. And Rubens was attempting to picture these two conflicting ideologies against each other as they sit against this um, around this table. You can actually, if you put one hand up and cover the left hand side of the painting, right where that window ends, you look you have one painting. And then if you cover up the right side, you have a totally different painting and a different feel. And it's like he's taken two separate paintings and shoved them together. And that was a very intentional use of the structure of the painting to tell the story and to visually clue us into the conflict that exists between the Pharisees and religious leaders of Jesus's time and Jesus. So the conflict is playing out in the very structure of the painting. The left side, we've got swirls of color and broken lines and tension, and you almost feel like some of the servants may dump something on somebody. A quick note on the servants, toward the back, there's one of the servants is holding a platter high in the air, and it has a peacock in it. Peacocks are a symbol of immortality or everlasting life. They were originally that in Greek and Roman times. And then early Christians adopted that symbol and they put it in some of the earliest Christian paintings we have will have a symbol of a peacock to signify everlasting life. And so we have the peacock there in the back. But getting back to the, the Pharisees, if we look at them, we have that first Pharisee sitting in the blue, just right opposite Christ, who we assume to be Simon. His face, when I look at him, he appears to be intrigued and curious. Uh, he's invited Christ to his home. So he there's a certain level of curiosity. He hasn't gone so far as to extend common courtesies to Christ, to wash his face, kiss him in greeting. He doesn't want to appear to give Christ his full endorsement. I've had this man to my house. More, I'm still taking my time in evaluating you. And so we have Simon there. But when you move over to the next two seated Pharisees, they've already passed judgment. They've decided this Jesus is not all right with them. They are, um, they appear angry and they look like they're plotting together as they sit at the table. The man in the middle of the two groups just looks smug to me. Um, he just looks like I, I'm here for the drama and watching this play out and who are these fishermen we have at the table? And he just looks smug. There's also a fifth Pharisee kind of in the back who's got on glasses, who's leaning over and watching everything play out. Then when you look closely on the other side, the disciples are kind of an odd mix, um, but they're sitting with Christ. One of them is just staring out at us, the viewer, it feels like. And the other one's are watching Christ, watching what the woman's doing, listening for the explanation of what's going on. So you have the disciples sitting there next to Christ. And that's basically the things we want to pay attention to in the painting. Oh, I didn't talk about the woman's clothing too much. It was generally assumed, although the New Testament account doesn't tell us this, that her sin was sexual, that she was a fallen woman, if you use that kind of terminology. And they denote that to us by having her dress falling off her shoulder and revealing part of her breast. And so we want to get the impression of maybe not a prostitute, but a woman who has fallen sexually. And that all of these men know this about her. She's known in their community as the fallen woman. And so she's there kissing Christ's foot and wiping his foot with her hair. I'm going to read the biblical account and it's from Luke 7 verses 36 through 50. And this is out of the NIV version. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. 
A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. As neither of them had the money to pay him back, he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven, little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like this video by giving us a thumbs up below and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss great commentary on classic works of art. KellyBagdanoff.com is your source for great content and curriculum as well as devotional materials using the medium of art. Make sure you visit and subscribe. Pablo Picasso said, Art washes from the soul the dust of everyday life. So take a moment to share this video because art is too important not to share. See you later, alligator.